Okay, great. Thanks, everyone, for being here today. Thanks too much for the, the panel for joining. Happy to be here with this uh, group of trading business leaders. We have Jatin Sirwanshi from Jeffries, Pankil Patel from Bank of America, Mike Missoni from Citi, and David Canizzo from Raymond James. And uh, with that, I'd like to load up the first poll question, if you could. Um, and while they're doing that, I'm going to put the question to the panelists. Hopefully, each of you can talk a little bit about your role and what you see as the biggest driver right now of, of change um, and, you know, from, from your viewpoint. We have sort of the broad categories, technology, regulation, competition from fintech, crypto, and client demand. So uh, Jatin, why don't you kick sure. us off? Thank you, Alton. Uh, I'm Jatin Surawanshi, uh, work with Jeffries. I've been with Jeffries for about 13 years. My primary responsibility is global algorithms. Um, we are a 100% agency execution desk, um, and we are live in about over 50 countries. So I've been doing this for about, uh, I would say, almost 20 years now. Uh, the question uh, is, is interesting, because some of the things which are here, probably I picked a few which are not here. Uh, so I think the two drivers, if I have to pick two, uh, would be our client demand. Number one is, since we are uh, an Italian execution uh, agency execution desk, we are totally dedicated to execution quality for our clients. Uh, and one of the things that has really, really picked up is working one-on-one -on -one with clients uh, instead of you know, having off-the-shelf solutions. Most of the, what people call customization, we call more like consultation, um, working with clients to kind of uh, give them the exact solutions they're looking for. And that is one of our biggest strengths. Uh, we focus in on, on that a lot, uh, takes away a lot of our resources and time. The second thing would be market structure. Uh, opportunities that we see in the market structure where we can offer solutions uh, which, care, which are best handled in an automated fashion. Uh, a good example would be something around the close, for example, the amount of volume and liquidity at the close. Uh, we came up with a solution which was more of a liquidity sourcing algorithm around the close instead of just a close benchmark solution which always existed. Uh, besides that, Algo Wheels is another area where uh, we spend a lot of time and resources. Uh, it's been growing, and uh, it's, been, uh, it's been a great uh, you know, insight into uh, how our clients are looking at executions, how they're comparing brokers, and what we can do to improve our execution quality. So the other two drivers, I'd say, are mine. Uh, Pankil Patel, so I run uh, Bank of America's electronic trading business uh, in the Americas, as well as the global execution product, products at the firm. Um, I've been in the business uh, 21 years. <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, but uh, no, uh, electronic trading um, you know, has, has been the heart of uh, what I've done for most of my career. Uh, and I look at, you know, I look at today, and, and I'm, I'm looking at the, the poll question here, and seeing the, the diverse response across technology and, and the new sources of competition. I kind of look at it this way, um, you know. I think I think all of these play a factor. Obviously, not so much crypto in, in, in our particular space right now, uh, although you know that's probably going to change in the future. Um, but technology is really driving um, the the landscape, and what I mean by that is both on what Jutton mentioned on the client side of the equation, you know, everyone is measuring, everyone's using data, everyone's having to decipher that data. So, so the valuation of, um, of your own order flow um, as a buy side institution, the value of that to the whole ecosystem, um, you know, as well as um, just the technological advances and being able to process that information. So when I look across the board, I see, I see, I see the, uh, the, the driving force really uh, is the information content that's being thrown off at all levels of the ecosystem. And then how do you harness that? How do you, how do you put that back together to create differentiated solutions that solve for your clients? And, and as Justin as, as John mentioned, it, it is very different across our different client bases, uh, whether, you're, whether you're dealing with long short hedge funds, quantitative hedge funds, um, the solution is very different across the board uh, when, when I think about the landscape. Um, I'm Mike Bassoni <coughs> from City. I appreciate you having me on here. Um, so I'm a 17-year drinker of the Kool-Aid at City, and uh, <coughs> came um, through. I'm actually a lawyer by background, so um, I was in private practice for about five years in the private equity markets before joining City and covering their their public equity trading business. <coughs> so I've given a lot of thought to this question over the years, and I've kind of come full circle on it. When I joined the business, coming from the private markets and the you know, late 90s, early aughts, I had a, uh, a number of 
technology-based private clients and developed a soft IP practice, kind of came to City with a little bit of a, of a technology background and figured I would, uh, well, I was given the runway to learn the regulatory part of the business, but then quickly, you know, that was 2005, right about Reagan, the time of Reagan MS being implemented. And then over the years, really just, you know, witnessed with full force the power of regulation and how it impacts the business through the global financial crisis, through things like the flash crash and other exogenous events that, that lead regulators to react <coughs> and, and, and really change the business. About five years ago, I moved out of our legal department and into the equity business and now into a cross-asset role to really focus on the intersection of, of, of technology and regulation. And I, as I said, I kind of come full circle and back to the belief that, that really what drives the business, I think, is, is technology. And, and now, you know, obviously with the emergence of new technologies, be it, um, you know, fintech in all its forms, I think that is radically changing the way that we look at our business, the way we, um, uh, the way we operate, the way clients want to be serviced. Um, so it certainly is a combination of the two, but I, you know, I think the, I think technology drives uh, just about everything we do. My name is uh, David Canizzo. I run electronic trading, institutional electronic trading at Raymond James. Uh, similar to Jutton, we provide um, global <clears throat> and U.S. equity algos, agency only, for institutional clients. Uh, when I look at this question, uh, I look at it a slightly different way. What is the biggest driving force uh, in? <laughs> how we use our resources as a firm to deliver things to our clients. So it's not one, but all of these, these items at any given point in time could shift your uh, allocation of focus and resources. Uh, regulation, in my mind, trumps all because regulation guides what we have to respond to, what we're allowed to do. Uh, it's certainly top of mind for almost any institution. Uh, but if, if I had my own personal uh, say in this, I would actually say client demand is the biggest driving force in what we do because everybody in this room um, is here to provide value to their clients and their investors. And without client need and client demand, um, you know, things wouldn't work. Um, <clears throat> sorry, we're all here to, uh, to make money at the end of the day. And if clients are not going to uh, need what you are providing them, then clearly you're not going to be successful in, in that delivery of that product. So. Uh, that's how I would look at it. Okay, great. And, um, and so everyone can see the results uh, of the poll. It seems like uh, FinTech and tech are, are you know, from the audience, uh, key drivers. Uh, regulation, which actually scored, uh, you know, sort of one of the few lower uh, factors in this poll has certainly been a big topic of this conference. Obviously, we, we um, heard a number of things from Commissioner Peirce this morning. A lot of you have talked to me about uh, some of the drivers. Uh, we have a lot of things coming from the SEC, especially a redefinition of Reg ATS. Um, perhaps we can get your your thoughts on you know maybe what's what's bad, what's good coming from the SEC. Mike, why don't we kick off with? Yeah, you? I mean, I think you know, I think we we we're at a conference that is is devoted in large part to regulation, but nonetheless, I think people are are ranking it lower than some other factors. <clears throat> There's probably a few things that are going into that. You know, the way that the, the, the pace of regulatory change, regulators are constantly trying to keep up with an ever-evolving technology landscape that just moves faster. And th that's not a blight on the part of regulators. That's part of the process, right? The, the SEC has to operate under uh, the Administrative Procedures Act, right? But Gary Gensler is not a dictator. He operates within the construct as an independent agency. He has to follow a process, a notice and comment process. So by the time... By the time the SEC puts out a rule proposal, takes in comments, ultimately moves to final, you know, the industry has had a good look at what was coming and, and, and is constantly evolving, you know, in some ways one step ahead. And again, I don't mean that as a, as a slight to regulators. Um, it's, it's, a, it's certainly a challenging environment for regulators to operate in. I do believe the current landscape that we're in, and it's not just this particular administration, but just the the days of of um, I think I think Commissioner Purse references the days of co five commissioners at the SEC going into a you know into their back room and deciding what they're going to do you know they may they may argue like you know, they may fight like cats and dogs but at the end of the day they're coming out publicly that it's a five zero unanimous vote here's the problem that we've identified here's what we're doing to solve it 
unfortunately, that's not really the way the SEC is operating any longer. And you know, you're, you're seeing very partisan votes on things. And then even after you go through this whole process of, <laughs> of proposal to comment to final rulemaking, then you get interested parties for whom a particular reg may have an adverse impact to their business model then suing the SEC over this. So at a certain point, people just tune a lot of this out. Because the reality of, uh, I think, what many of us are struggling with in this environment with regular, you know, we're, we're talking about pretty seismic things that are being proposed right now, be it on the SEC lending landscape or position reporting of total return swaps, short sale disclosure, reg ATS, a whole host of issues that are impacting the hedge fund business and private fund advisors, um, sh shortening the settlement cycle. I mean, you could go on and on, the dealer proposal. How much of this, I think many of us are, are saying, how much of this was really thought through in a way that um, we believe the, the final rulemaking will really resemble something very much akin to what was proposed? And uh, how much of it was just kind of thrown out there for the industry to comment on and then ultimately um, you know, may or may not be adopted, may or not be challenged? You know? And I think that sort of, that's, I think, one of the reasons why regulation is kind of moving a little bit lower on people's list. Okay, did you want anyone? Uh, yeah, no, I, I agree. I think um, I, would put, I, I would put regulation at, at, at the, the bottom as well, only because the time and effort it takes to put these things through, I think it takes on average, you know, five months to six years to get things uh, pushed through. But um, what I will say with this, uh, with this uh, administration and, and, and this SEC is that, um, you know, we would hope that the, you know, historically, you know, the, the commission would take their time. They would look at the data. They would propose things um, that, you know, would would um, you know put things off for comment period. And whereas, I, what we feel there's been a change is that you know there's a, 50 different things coming out across the different things that you mentioned from sec lending, which, you know, really has, you know, coming out without potentially, you know taking the time to do the analysis and, and making comments um, that that can really steer the direction of travel for, for, for uh, you know, firms like ourselves. Um, you know, we'd hope that there'd be a little bit of uh, um, uh, collaboration there in that, in that respect, um, because we, have, we sit on tons of data as well, right? And, and we are industry participant and we can, we can uh, help, help with that conversation. Um, but I do think I do think that there you know there are definitely things that um, you know when we look at um, you know the market structure and, and the MBBO I think we would all agree up that you know the MBBO is probably not you know 100% reflective of the the effective quote um, and it's it's partly due to the market structure partly due to um, passive trading proliferation of odd lots um, flow trading off board and and I think that that that's that's another interesting one. Um, you know, as people uh, in the industry are using technology and quantitative methodologies to warehouse risk and things like that, you're seeing uh, a proliferation of, of liquidity trading. Uh, you know, not on ETSs, but actually trading uh, trading um, off off on single dealer platforms or, or central risk books. And so, I think these are all valid um, concerns. You know, that that, uh, that that Gensler is bringing to the table, um, and something that we should probably uh, spend time on and look at. Um, but again, it, it really boils down to, um, you know, like a fact, two thirds of all the notional traded, um, you know, today in the U.S. markets is actually happening interest spread, right? So, so there's definitely things to look at here. Um, but again, I think uh, the solutions are probably, you know, instead of being prescriptive at the top, um, I think if we spent more time um, listening to the industry, we'd get to a good solution. And so, uh, since competition showed up as as, as the, I guess, the, the leading uh, driver from the audience, uh, perhaps we can get your thoughts, as, especially on some of the evolving competitors. We have Citadel, Virtu, Jane Street becoming more competitive. Um, how do you think about evolving competition? And, you know, where do you see, um, you know, so, sort of where do you see yourself in the landscape? And how do you see these competitors evolving? And Jatin, maybe we'll start with you. Sure. <coughs> Well, the firms you mentioned, uh, we don't look at them as competitors. Uh, they're in a very different game than they are. We look at them more as partners. They're providers of liquidity. Now, we don't really have to take that liquidity or access that liquidity. There's ample liquidity in the public markets, but that's every broker's decision. 
Um, we look at it differently, probably. Uh, Pankil looks at it differently. Dave looks at it differently. Uh, but from our perspective, uh, it's an entirely different uh, problem that they are solving versus what we are trying to solve. We are working with the institutions to move large positions to, to liquidate risk over multiple days sometimes. Uh, it's more about liquidity. It's about how to minimize impact, how to source liquidity more efficiently, how to work in order over time. While uh, the most of the market making community is more focused on uh, order placement, uh, latency, uh, queue positions, uh, they're trying to win every battle. We are trying to win the war, if, if that makes sense. Uh, <clears throat> So we look at them as providers of liquidity. So when it is beneficial to our clients, uh, we would like to access the liquidity. Otherwise, not. Uh, the other thing is uh, <clears throat> there's a whole lot of expertise that is being developed by much smaller brokers um, in our space. Uh, and they are gaining traction. So when you look at clients' algo wheels, performance, and everything, uh, you see a lot of brokers who are not uh, extremely large, uh, but they're doing very well in certain areas. So I think that, to us, is competition. What are they doing well, and why are they doing well, and what are the things that, that they're good at? So we kind of try to learn from that, do our own research. Uh, but I think the DNA, which we have, is very different from a market maker DNA. And uh, they, we, we try to solve different problems. And I think if you work together, it will be a much better solution for our clients. OK. you want to add anything? Uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, look, from my perspective at, at Bank of America, we, we touch um, these market makers. Um, in many different uh, lenses. One, one as an algorithmic provider, we may be utilizing them for their alternative liquidity. We we'll obviously touch them on the exchanges. Um, we also uh, run one of the biggest clearing platforms for uh, professional trading. So, so we have uh, market makers that are that are using our clearing capabilities uh, at the organization. And then on top of that, we we run one of the biggest private wealth management businesses. Uh, we have 100 to 200 million shares of retail flow. Um, so we're big users of the wholesalers. So. So um, you know we're we like seeing competition in the, in that realm. Um, you know I think um, you know uh, specifically uh, on the on the retail side. Um, you know it, it's all about the end investor and 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 the, the EQ we can provide them. And you know these firms do a phenomenal job of providing a service to the industry. Um, you know for for us in managing all of that order flow for our clients. So. So competition is healthy. Um, I think you see concentration. You know, uh, you look at ETFs, and you see, you know, hey, maybe there's a few firms in the industry that have really, uh, you know, focused their effort on, on that niche. Um, but they're all getting into each other's uh, businesses now um, because I think they have the technological wherewithal, right? They're they're sophisticated. They can take their technology and move to different markets very quickly, um, and get into different asset classes very quickly. So um, so. Competition is healthy, and, and we're happy we're seeing it. I would just like to add, um, I echo a lot of what Jutton said. Um, we do access the market makers for liquidity when it's necessary um, or value added to our execution. But at the end of the day, like I said earlier, um, we're not looking at our competition and uh, targeting ways to do better than they are. Um, we hope that our product performs better at the end of the day. But we're really listening and partnering with our clients um, to try to solve their pain points, try to improve their experience, their execution, and navigate you know, these complex markets that we, that we execute in today. Uh, and then the end result, hopefully, is that we are you know, competing with the rest of the, the industry and doing well. I don't think we, at least in, in my seat, I don't hyper-focus on what XYZ firm is doing and how do I do it better, necessarily. I think uh, the results are just more, more of a feedback loop from, from clients that drive what we do. I mean, from the perspective of a, of a huge global institution, right? I mean, we're, gonna, we're gonna play to our strengths just like anybody, any firm ought to if you're really thinking strategically about the way that you, you service your clients. So, you know, from, from my perspective, City, you know, I've been with City long enough to know that our, our, we're, we're encumbered by a lot of regulatory obligations that some other participants in the market that aren't bank holding companies are not, and they're able to compete more nimbly, and they're able to, um, you know, roll out technology faster. And there's just a whole host of things that others are, other firms might be able to do um, that we just can do, but have to do in a more thoughtful, uh, sort of process-oriented way. And I've long ago come to come to terms with that. The flip side of that is, 
you know, we've got the largest global footprint in the world and we've got a huge balance sheet and clients come to us because they need liquidity. At the end of the day, the liquidity drives so much of what we're doing. I mean, everybody's touched on this. We're living through this now. Yesterday was a prime example of, of you know, you have a, a market that's in turmoil right now, kind of coming to grips with a lot of different exogenous factors. And then you've got clients who are really stepping away. So we, we're, we exist, we operate in this extremely fragmented landscape. We're trying to piece together those pools of liquidity. We're dealing with the smile curve where you've got your two big you know, liquidity events during the day and then a real lull in between. So our algos are, are you know, we've, we've made huge investments in technology. We were fortunate. Sometimes it's better to be lucky than good. But we, we put a lot of money into our electronic trading platform and rolled out a number of enhancements, technology enhancements, right at the beginning in February of 2020. So just as volumes really spiked, we were in a much better position to, to, to deal with that um, aggressively and opportunistically. So you, you've got, you know, if you're too aggressive with your algos, then you're oftentimes leaking information into the marketplace. If you're not aggressive enough, you're sort of underperforming the market. So we're, we're trying to find that sweet spot. One, one other thing that we, we've done, um, which I think is unique, is... is um, you know, everybody's focused on CRB, central risk books, right? And, and it's a major, major development in the industry, a major source of liquidity provisioning. Um, we're sourcing liquidity from more, more external sources, and we're also trying to be smarter about the way that we interact with liquidity within our own four walls. So we, we've been able to utilize something called factor facilitation. It's essentially a, a, a way for, uh, unlike, a, unlike a dark pool where, you know, you can really only cross two, two agency orders in the same ticker, for example. We're able to facilitate orders on, uh, you know, a, 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 um, you know we're, we're able to facilitate orders in, let's say, Intel and AMD, right? We're willing to take the principal, you know, the other side of that and, and, and facilitate a, a sell and a buy. And, of course, there's idiosyncratic risk between, you know, two securities as opposed to just the same security, but, but we're able to manage that risk better. We're able to do it in a pretty close to real-time basis. And essentially, you know, we're flat every, uh, you know, every whatever the period of time is, whether it's five or 10 minutes. And we're able to provide clients more liquidity in that way than you would if you were just operating a traditional dark pool. So those are, that's just an example of a, a unique set of liquidity. We're, we're constantly whiteboarding this and trying to figure out ways that we can we can make the client experience better in a fragmented landscape. Okay, and and maybe now we'll load up our next poll, um, which which digs into technology, um, also cited uh, by the audience as as a key driver. And so, um, perhaps the audience can can let us know what they think is the most interesting <coughs> coverage innovation. And then uh, turning to our our panel, we have. Investment in algo wheels, uh, pre and post trade analytics, AI. Um, how do you think about these tools? Are they changing your your business? Um, you know, any that are the most interesting to you? And perhaps David, if you want to um, kick us off on this question. Sure. Um, well, central risk books are uh, a a product that uh, we at Raymond James uh, don't have that conflict of interest to, to worry about. So I can't speak on that, that specific one. But I would say, uh, you know, as an industry, we need to be careful um, in maintaining a balance of what is useful and additive and needed, um, because too much innovation just for the sake of innovating could become paralyzing at times. Uh, for, for us, in, in my seat, um, algo wheels are certainly top of, top of mind, even though they've been around for a while and the topic has been discussed widely through the industry for years. Uh, the issue with Algo Wheel specifically is, you know, we cater to hundreds and thousands of clients. There are several providers of Algo Wheels. Each Algo Wheel is implemented uh, differently for at each client. Uh, at a very high level, you think about um, why they were invented, and many clients use them simple as an agnostic way to bifurcate flow to their brokers without being biased. Uh, because they have to pay that broker for, for research or for whatever reason it could be. Um, the other version of Algo Wheels at a high level is uh, the client or the Algo Wheel provider will run some pre-trade analytics and bucket the flows into different segments and then have wheels within those buckets. So then we have to respond and cater and tweak our algorithms to make sure it's aligned with the desired outcome of that wheel and that client. 
And then another version of the wheel that I've engaged is uh, the clients are using the wheel as a technology to implement their trade. It's not just sending an order off to a broker. They're actually making trading decisions within the wheel and utilizing uh, our SORs or aggregators and, and algos to, to, uh, to execute that trade. Um, I also think um, it's not interesting, but, it's, but it certainly <laughs> creates some complexity for us uh, are, is the analytics component to this question. Uh, we, we spend an inordinate amount of time with data and analytics, and I kind of giggle inside when I, when I think about this because as important as analytics uh, is in, in the industry to uh, execute, to measure best execution, to make trading decisions, uh, it's, there's not a week that goes by that I don't engage a scenario where um, we, we can't even agree on the data. Right. Uh, I mean, what I'm trying to say is, if you pulled 15 buy side firms and 15 brokerages and said calculate the interval VWAP for an order, you would come up with 10 different answers. Uh, so I think we have a lot more to work on in that area, specifically. And I do think the most interesting—that's what the question is. The most interesting broker brokerage innovation is what the audience has said. Uh, the new innovative ATSs. Uh, such as One Kronos and PureStream and, 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 and Intelligent Cross. Uh, and it's my job to work those uh, innovative ATSs and sources of liquidity into the execution algorithms. I think you can use them in ways that um, traditional dark pools uh, were not meant to be used. So it's certainly providing a value add to our clients. I mean, you think about, think about just these innovative ATSs and other types of innovations and the impact that regulation could is or could potentially have on that. So if, you know, many of us have talked for many years about a, um, a addressing the issue of fragmentation in the market, what, what can you do about it? You know, perhaps you implement some sort of market share threshold in order to obtain protected quote status. Um, so that idea has been out there for a long time. I'm, I'm hearing it may be gaining some traction. But the flip side of that, while, while on the one hand that could address the fragmentation issue, the flip side is you've got these innovative ATSs that may not be at 2.5% market share and may never have the opportunity to get there in a way that, you know, whatever, IEX or others did. <clears throat> so how do you, how, as a regulator, how do you address a problem that many of us acknowledge is there, right, this issue of fragmentation, while not stifling innovation? That's not an easy balance to strike. Um, but... Uh, you know, I think to one of your earlier questions about current regulations, one plain, fairly obvious, um, you know, imbalance in this ATS proposal is the impact it could have on all of this. If you deem everything to be an exchange, which may be an extreme read of what of, of what came out, but it's it, there's there's a lot of language in there that, if not clarified, we don't even have a definition of what a communication protocol system is. <laughs> so, if not clarified, then you leave open the possibility that if approved and adopted ultimately, that 10 years from now, a different SEC regime could look at this and say, well, all of this was in scope and therefore needs to be registered. And you know, So traditional brokerage activity, traditional upstairs activity in the form of IOIs or RFQs or you know, would have to be registered as an, as an exchange or looped into your ATS construct. And that's a pretty onerous task. I worry personally about the impact that may have on liquidity overall in an already liquidity-starved environment. I have a slightly different take on that. <clears throat> I do believe that the new innovative ATSs, which are ranking number one here, are the most critical uh, piece of infrastructure that is coming up. And the reason I say that is by experience. Uh, and I wrote down all of these order types and ATSs which have come up and we are heavy users of, like starting from D-Limit, NASDAQ Mellow, Intelligent Cross, Level VWAP Cross, PureStream, extended close, periodic auctions, one chronos coming up, uh, Coda Fusion auctions. I mean, these are all innovations which were created, not with, the, not with the objective of gaining market share. That was never, they were, most of them were designed around improving execution quality. So it's upon us brokers to identify which ones of these work for us, how to use them, uh, when do they work, um, and, and for which order types uh, you want to use with which certain strategy. We've done extensive work on this. We're one of the first to integrate with, with a new venue, a new order type. We try to collect data. We try to measure it. And uh, just from numbers, I could tell you that by using a combination of these order types and ETSs, we've been able to improve performance by 5 to 10% of the spread on passive strategies. Now, that's huge. What are we, We're not predicting price here. What we're trying to do is eliminate impact 
use, uh, use auto types which are helping us, uh, helping us not have to navigate through the fragmented HFT-oriented exchanges, but maybe cross something at the parent level. Uh, uh, maybe, have, maybe have a venue where you can actually control your, uh, your cross rates and uh, the market conditions in which you cross. So these are all innovations which we are really supportive of. We want every broker to kind of look at it in that way because the more volume that, that helps them, that supports this kind of innovation, is really going to be helpful to our clients in the end. Yeah, I, I, I echo that. I mean, we've been big investors in the alternative kind of space of, of, of these ATSs, uh, whether it's PureStream, uh, Luminex, uh, Level merged recently. But uh, we echo the same thing, right? It ultimately boils down to um, you, you have a res responsibility for the customer order flow that you're hang handling, you know, achieving you know, their benchmarks. We talk about best decks, but ultimately each individual client has, has uh, their, own, their own vision of what best decks is for, for, for what they're trying to implement at that moment in time. And it's important that we can leverage all of this innovation um, you know, in ways to actually, and it's not just ATS innovation. Exchanges are also coming coming to us with uh, order types that are really centered around execution quality, and I think that's the big difference. Uh, when we look ten years ago, the proliferation of order types was always around that market share or or gaining some 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 level of uh, 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 edge in the flow and bringing it in uh, into the pool. But now, execution quality is the number one driver for all of us up here, right? And I think that's the biggest change in terms of where, where we've seen the industry go, and I mentioned this before, with everyone measuring it, all elements of this life cycle, of this ecosystem, it's absolutely important that you have the ability to, to trial and, and, and try these, these new uh, order types out, because you'll find sometimes they work for certain flows, other times they don't work for, for uh, other flows. So uh, definitely, definitely uh, an important medium for us. I think also uh, one of the big things uh, I call it the trajectory medium. Um, you know, so you know we've always been trained in point in time, and everything has to, you know, irrespective of the size, you know, has to cross at that at that at that point in time. But here we're also talking about that the MBBO might not be <clears throat> the most reflective of, of of where where true prices are. So, you know, the medium of trajectory crossing and short duration crossing, whether it's a VWAP, um, you know, level recently introduced the first. Um, trajectory room that's really going to allow brokers to, to interact with each other in this medium. So uh, think of it as natural crossing, algo crossing that can happen uh, in that medium. Pure stream as well has come up with something based on participation rates. And so we're seeing a lot of traction in these, in these new types of uh, these order types, and they are actually improving uh, the execution quality quite significantly. There's one more data point I just want to uh, talk about. Uh, so when we look at our executions across all our strategies, more than 50% of our executions are actually happening in venues which cumulatively, not individually, cumulatively form less than 10% of the market share, equity market share. So that kind of tells you that it's not the large venues which are more critical to us. It's actually the new and upcoming uh, order types and ATSs. Uh, could be an exchange or could be an ATS. Uh, but as long as it's helping improve quality, uh, that's where we are migrating towards. And that kind of reflects in that number. Okay, and uh, one ATS that didn't come up is Blue Ocean, which is with taking a newer strategy, uh, catering to the after hours trading. Uh, Pankil, you also have a former colleague that is creating the, the 24 exchange. Uh, maybe we'll queue up the final poll question, uh, which asks about uh, 24 hour trading. Um, and, and I'll ask all of you, you what your thoughts are. Is this something that, you know, what's driving it? Is it gonna happen? Is it a good, good or bad thing? Um, and and Paco, maybe I'll start with you on that. Um, so I think, uh, well, you know, I'm getting old. I don't want to be up 24 hours. Uh, but <laughs> but, uh, but look, if you look across um, all the other asset classes, uh, FX, crypt, crypto, right? These are all 24, 24 hour markets, and the markets are so interlinked and intertwined now. And and a lot of the listings, ETF proliferation of ETFs, and how these things are. Um, you know, global in nature, uh, represent different aspects around the world. Um, it's not, you know, look, I, I think it's, uh, it's definitely, uh, there's an opportunity there. How big will that opportunity be? Um, it remains to be seen, but look, if you're not leading, uh, you know, if, if, you're, if you're not innovating and you're not trying these things out, um, you know, then, then you'll never know. Uh, but I do think that um, 
you know, in, in examples of blue ocean and 24 hour trading, um, you know, the, the Asia markets with the ETFs here locally, right? So the other big thing is the information. Uh, you know, just in the, in the world today, the news travels so fast um, that you need to be able to uh, act on that. And so I think there is, there is legs, for, leg, legs in the equity market for 24 hour trading. I just don't know how big it will be. It seems an eventuality, you know, in some form or another, just given, given the blurring of lines between, you know, I think the, the pandemic certainly exacerbated this blurring of lines between, you know, work and not work and, you know, ability to trade and this, this boom in retail trading on, you know, handheld, on handheld devices and apps. I just feel like crypto is certainly exacerbating this trend. So, uh, you know, I believe that plays into you're, you're in order to facilitate that, and albeit probably, I agree with the, the the bulk of folks in the room who said that it's probably just going to be for the most liquid names, at least at first. But um, in order to facilitate that, you either have to have a pretty significant global presence, so that you're staffing trading desks 24/7, or you're, you know, staying up all night or paying somebody to stay up all night. But in in reality, I think it. It probably endorsed to the benefit of the, the, the big global players more than, than others. Um, put aside what it, you know, the, the lifestyle impact. I mean, I'm, I, you know, I'm not all that excited about um, this blurring of lines between, between work and play, but that's, that, that cat is out of the bag. And, you know, any of us who had kids during the pandemic know that, that, that there really is no line anymore. But put, that, put aside the lifestyle type of impact. I think a bigger concern from a liquidity standpoint, I mentioned the smile curve earlier where you have these two big liquidity events during the day and then you've got a big period of time during the trading day where not too much is going on, or at least from an institutional perspective. Um, if you now extend that all the way out, um, I think you're just exacerbating that, that, that difficulty and that, that trend and I worry about what it means for liquidity you know, during that whole time. I think a lot of the institutional community would rather have fewer trading hours, not more. And we're kind of, but, but I, I just think the direction of travel is, is moving towards closer to a 24 seven environment. I just, if I can just jump in, I, I wonder if this was more of, I mean, obviously it has to do with crypto uh, and I think the uptick in retail trading and everybody trading from your phone potentially 24 seven. I wonder how the pricing would work uh, first, but it's kind of funny because three years ago at STA National in DC, there was discussion around going to four trading days, longer trading days to uh, work around the clock around the globe. A lot of efi efficiencies there, and it seems like we've gone full circle, in the, you know, and during the pandemic, and now we're thinking about 24/7 trading. And, and um, yeah, I, I do think if it does have success, it would be for the most liquid names. I just don't know the amount of liquidity that's going to be there, and is it something that's really useful for institutions? I, I, I would think not. And so we're about out of time, but I want to get one in on high touch trading. So um, obviously a lot of changes uh, to the business and no longer the dominant form, but, but, but still important. Um, how has that changed post pandemic? And, um, you know, I guess related to the pandemic and then just going forward, any changes that you see there? Uh, yeah, so uh, look, both businesses are extremely healthy. From, from, uh, from our perspective, uh, we've had record years with our high touch business. Um, I think the last three years, the market shocks, the volatility, um, people are, I think people are doing a better job of, of understanding when to use different channels and when, when value can come from that high touch channel. Um, and whether it's you know, management of order flow, you know, you, you've got wheels now, your inflows, outflows are, are automated, they're going in. It's, it's, leaving traders with more difficult situations potentially that they're managing and leveraging the high touch desks in, in that scenario works very well. Um, and I think so there's, you know, one where I'd say the, the, the high touch desks have transformed to is a little bit more about the risk provisioning. So we're, we're doing a much better job with the central risk books as, as discussed in warehousing that risk. Um, and, and being able to, you know, use those cross, cross uh, sectional factors, things like that to, to really provide liquidity at the times when you actually need it. Um, and I think the other trend that I see is um, folks are more and more 
are, are, are becoming open even, even on facilitation on algo wheels at the top of a wheel, right? So, you know, we spend a lot of time, it's, it's, it, the clients spend a lot of time on, you know, here's my benchmark, you know, they refine those benchmarks for those different flows. Um, but if somebody is willing to provide me that liquidity up front at a better, uh, you know, uh, transaction cost or, or a better, better than what I can uh, achieve via those benchmarks that I've established for myself, why wouldn't I think about that? And so I think just across the board, um, you know, we've, again, the high touch business is, 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 is definitely doing very well. Um, and I think there's also, um, you know, for big organizations like ourselves, the amount of order flow that just uh, unique order flow that we actually come across. Uh, we have a very big retail franchise, um, you know, lockups, lockdowns that come off, um, uh, just the, the private equ the equity space when things come down, so family offices. There, there's a lot of unique liquidity that's sitting at Bank of America Merrill Lynch that really the high touch desk is a center point for that, right? And it comes together there, and there's usually different differentiated opportunities to find liquidity. I'm not sure the pandemic is is really a driver behind it. I mean, uh, all trading, uh, most most trading businesses, and certainly many uh, most channels are doing really well right now. I mean, we're riding the, we're riding the the tailwinds of of heightened volumes and volatility. And um, but as I look down the field a bit, I think that you know at the levels of volatility that we're seeing now, clients generally want less. You know, they're they're less they're, they have less of a risk appetite, and many are just stepping back. And so. I think the combination of that plus a deal calendar, which is, you know, new issuances are, are challenged right now. I mean, last year at this time, the comps for Q1 last year was, you know, a SPAC market that was booming prior to regulation really, you know, um, kind of quashing that in large part, but also commercial reasons. And, and so we're, 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 we're moving into a world of, of less issuance and um, certainly more volatility. I could see that becoming you know, those becoming some pretty serious headwinds for, for the, the high-touch channel. Um, but I also think that as, as more leverage, you know, as the, as the system becomes more deleveraged, I think you have more balance sheet available. And, you know, that's, that's, that's what makes the business fun. I mean, this, this is ultimately a, a very competitive, very innovative, and very cyclical business. And those of us who have been around it a few times you can kind of see, you know, it's, it's an interesting we're certainly living in interesting times and, and, and a lot to, to kind of strategize around. The only thing I'd like to add to that is uh, we're seeing a lot of convergence uh, <clears throat> between high touch and low touch. We're calling it one touch. Essentially, the convergence of uh, coverage, less so, but more convergence of liquidity where you know clients are looking for, hey, I'd be working in order in your algo, but if you have an IOI out there, I want you to take care of it for me. Get me that liquidity. I don't want to have to make a call to separate desks. And uh, that is something which I think is going to lead to some innovation and uh, some unique solutions in the future. We're seeing the same thing Jutton just said. Uh, our clients are actually using our high touch desk more uh, during times of volatility to, for risk mitigation, but also they're leaning on their most trusted relationships they've had for years, uh, especially with the hybrid workplace where most of the sell side uh, has their traders in an office uh, or they have better scale, uh, some of our buy side clients are still work from home or in a hybrid model. And I think they, they definitely lean on the high touch desk more in this environment uh, for moments when they may, you know, maybe at a Zoom call or away from their uh, main work environment. Uh, this is what we're seeing and hearing. Great. I think that's a, a great place to leave it. Uh, thank you all so much for your insights and perspective. Um, great insights.